Okay, let's look at some different overall designs. Plate heat exchanger, tube and shell, spiral, plate uh, fin heat exchanger, and a regenerative heat exchanger. So the plate heat exchanger, I have a small model here. Uh, you have different plates. And the hot medium flows on every second and the cold medium on every second. So the hot medium goes in and distributes and goes in the same direction on all plates. And the cold medium goes in if you want counter current set up in the other way. Uh, and then goes on every second. And these plates are rather thin. Uh, they can look like this if it's not a model. Uh, so this is slightly bigger, but they can, these can be like six meters high or they can be really, really tiny. Uh, so there are many different sizes. And there are a number of pros and cons with this one. It's, it's very flexible. If you want to increase the area, you can just uh, put in more plates. You get high K values because this material is rather thin. So if you look from that side there, it's, it's really thin. So the over, overall heat transfer coefficient gets high. You can have something like 3.5 to 5.5 kilowatts per square meter in Kelvin in this one of these. It's easy to disassemble, you just take it apart uh, and then you can clean it easily. It's easier to inspect and see if everything seems to be working fine. And it's a rather compact thing. And due to the, the thin walls, you can also work with small temperature differences. But not everything is good. One problem is that these gaskets are typically sensitive to high temperature and high pressure. So that's a downside. But there is a workaround for that. And that's to weld or brace these together, uh, these different plates. Now, you lose some of the pros with this thing, because if you weld or brace it together, then you can't take it apart. It's more difficult to clean. So things tend to get stuck in here. Uh, and should you weld it or should you brace it? Yeah, welding is a bit more difficult than bracing. When you weld, you, the material you melt is very similar to the material you want to put together. So the plates are made of essentially the same material as, as the material you melt. Uh, while you, if you brace, you use a different uh, metal, a met typically a metal that melts at a lower temperature, making it much easier to put together. But if you have different metals, uh, well, then you get corrosion uh, because of the difference between the two metals. The next one is a tube and shell heat exchanger. You will see one at the lab. I don't have a model of the tube and shell, but I have a, a model of the of something very similar. The lamella heat exchanger. So the only difference here is that instead of these things here being pipes, so round things, these are flat. But the basic principle is the same. You have one media that goes inside uh, these channels, so tubes in, in a tube and shell heat exchanger, and you have one media that goes on the outside. It's usually difficult to understand drawings of tube and shell heat exchanger if you haven't seen one before, and that's why we do the lab uh, where you you uh, you look at uh, one in real life and see what is a baffle, for example. Uh, how does that work? Uh, a nice thing with a tube and shell exchanger is that you it's really flexible at the design sta stage. You can, for example, decide if you want these tubes to be just long or if you want to bend them so that the flow goes several times through the equipment. Uh, you can have another pro is that you can have really large differences in flow rates on the hot and cold side if you want to. You can build it so that it withstands really high pressures or temperatures. But there are also problems. Uh, one problem is that you don't get as high K values, overall heat transfer coefficients, as you do for a plate heat exchanger. And it's rather difficult to, to clean uh, the shell side. So, I mean, if you want to clean the inside of of these channels, yeah, what you can do is you use high pressure uh, water, for example, and flush through or take um, 
something to scrub uh, and but in between uh, becomes difficult I mean imagine you have let's say you have 100 tubes uh, in a large package to get in in the center between those that's really difficult the next one is the spiral heat exchanger and it looks like this there is a hot side and the cold side so uh, and there is a lid here so we can put it here and then for example have the hot medium going in in the center and then spiraling out and if we want that to be a counter current then we want the, oops. <laughs> then we want the cold medium to go uh, the other direction right and then we have a lid there as well if that's difficult to understand perhaps it's easier to if i show you like this there are of course pros and cons with this one as well it's suitable for different combinations of liquid steam gas so you can have liquid on one side and gas on the other side for example uh, it's rather limited in the temperature and pressure uh, because of these joints here. Uh, better than the plate heat exchanger, but still uh, rather limited in temperature and pressure. And you get medium K values, so perhaps 1.5 to 2 kilowatts per square meter in Kelvin. You can uh, equip uh, a heat exchanger with surface enlargement and that you can do in different ways sometimes you see the, those on radiators uh, and why do I say that the radiator is a heat exchanger it's only one medium isn't it well no it's two you have the uh, the radiator and on the inside you have a liquid like hot water for example and on the outside you have air so air is one medium and the liquid inside the radiator is another. Uh, this is an example with uh, surface enlargement. So why would you need this? Uh, well, if you have a gas, gases have uh, very low um, heat transfer coefficients. And by increasing the area, you can counteract that. So this one is made for liquid on the inside and then a gas on the outside and there are different kinds of uh, uh, this one i would call a plate uh, and fin heat exchanger so plates here and then fin like things there and there are many different variants of of that uh, you can have for example uh, just a pipe and then you have uh, circular things uh, Old, sometimes uh, in old houses there are radiators that are made like this, a large pipe and then just metal things, uh, metal plates that enlarge the area. Regenerative heat exchangers. Uh, here is one example. The idea with a regenerative heat exchanger uh, is that when I breathe out, my hot air heats these uh, metal things here. So these are metal channels there. And when, then when I inhale, the cold air is being heated up by these metal things. Uh, so this particular thing that's made for running, skiing, uh, similar things when it's really cold outside. It actually helps uh, a lot. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that uh, your breath contains a lot of water, water vapor. And if you exercise heavily, then uh, also some spit and other things uh, get, tend to get stuck in this. And it freezes and it becomes rather yucky. But still, uh, this actually works uh, rather good. There is a, a, an efficiency issue with this one, and that's if you breathe out, uh, the, these channels are filled with used air. And then you breathe in, and then you take some of that air back in again. You can compa compare that with a snorkel. You, you shouldn't have very long snorkels because 
when you breathe in and you breathe out, if you have a very long snorkel, the only thing that happens is that you take the same air in and out and in and out and in and out, and then you die from asphyxiation. So that's not good. A more common uh, regenerative heat exchanger than this one is what it, uh, you can see on houses. Uh, so then you have a big circular thing and then uh, channels like this that goes round, round, round. So, uh, and then on one side you have, on the top side, for example, you can have indoor air going out and the uh, bottom half you can have outer air going in. And uh, as these channels go around, uh, they get indoor air uh, and then it's heated up and then they come to the other side and then the outdoor air is heated up uh, by these channels. And if you look really carefully, they have made attempts there to, to solve the, this inefficiency issue. So they typically have a small, small section where they try to purge the used air. I mean, if you, if you work in a restaurant, for example, you want to get rid of all the uh, smells uh, from the kitchen, uh, and get in fresh air, you don't want the, uh, the used air to get back in. And then there is a way of actually blowing uh, the, these channels uh, one time with uh, fresh air to empty them. Okay, so that was a number of different designs. But I said that the overall heat transfer coefficient is really important and you need to be able to estimate that somehow. And when we estimate that, we need a number of different uh, dimensionless numbers. Nusselt, uh, Prantl, Reynolds, and Grassoff's number. The th uh, so there is a definition for Nusselt's number, from Prantl's number, uh, Reynolds number, and Grassoff's number. Uh, and you can calculate those uh, for your particular set setup. So you, you need to decide, for example, how, what is, should the velocity be in these channels? And from that you can calculate the Reynolds number. Uh, what is the medium? What is the uh, viscosity of the medium? What is the heat capacity? What is the conductivity? From that you can calculate the Prandtl number. You need a characteristic distance uh, and the overall heat, uh, sorry, the heat transfer coefficient and the conductivity to calculate Nusselt number. But then you need something else as well. Something that tells you about, okay, in this situation, how can I estimate the Nusselt number based on Reynolds and Prandtl, or Rain, if it's force convection, uh, or Reynolds and Grassoff's number if it's natural convection, like in a radiator, outside of the radiator at home. Uh, when you do estimations, it's good if you know approximately uh, what values you can expect of uh, in different situations and different media. Uh, but note that numbers such as these, they are just suggestions. <laughs> there can be examples where you have deviations, small or large, from these values. One particular difficult problem is to say, what is the heat transfer coefficient when a liquid is boiling? The thing with boiling is that there are different kinds of boiling. Uh, natural convection boiling is just one of them. Uh, so if you look carefully when you boil water, uh, if you look carefully in the pan, you can see that first small bubbles are formed. And then uh, after a while when it boils really a lot, you essentially have a gas layer at the bottom. And this, these different cases will lead to totally different heat transfer coefficients. So if you really want to calculate heat transfer, the overall heat transfer coefficient carefully for a situation when you have a heat exchanger where you have boiling on one side or if you have condensing on one side, then you actually need to divide the heat exchanger in different parts and say, okay, well, in this part I have overheated steam in this part I have condensing steam, uh, and in this part I only have liquid. And then you will get different heat transfer coefficients in the different parts, and actually all, also in the uh, part where it actually boils, you will have different values. 
in our course. Ah, uh, that's too tough. So we will instead just use natural convection boiling and say that, well, okay, uh, the heat transfer coefficient, if it's boiling, it's somewhere close to what the natural convection boiling is. In fact, equations for estimating boiling, uh, the heat transfer coefficients you get for boiling, uh, they can be rather complicated. And as one author wrote a couple of years back, uh, he suggested a new uh, equation uh, that he said was easier than most uh, and about as accurate as any. So all these different equations that, that you can find in the literature, you can't trust the values that much. So you, what you typically want to do in, in a real situation is that you use one of these equations and try to calculate the best you can and then you need to make an experiment. So you build a small uh, factory, for example, and see, does this work? You test it in the lab and so on. Uh, the one we're going to use for natural convection boiling comes from Stefan and Abdel Salam in their paper 1980. And in the handbook, I have a simplified graph. Uh, um, so they published several different graphs. I've put them together in a simplified manner. Uh, and not that uh, the power there, the Q, the small Q there is uh, the watts per square meter uh, that is being transferred. And the N there is different if it's water or if it's hydrocarbons. Not much, but a little. 0 0.673 uh, compared to 0 0.67. When you try to estimate these uh, values for overall heat transfer coefficients, you need the characteristic dimension in the Nusselt number and you need it also in the Reynolds number. And what is the characteristic di uh, distance? Well, outside tube bundles, it's the uh, if it, the flow is along the tubes, then it's four times the area of the water filled cross section divided by the circumference in contact with the liquid. So that's the hydraulic diameter. And for flow along tubes, that becomes this value. So uh, this first equation here, that's actually valid for more cases. And the second one is if it's flow along tubes. And P there, that's the distance between center to center of, of these tubes, the out. Uh, that's the outer di uh, diameter of, of the tubes. If you have natural convection, you still need to have a characteristic distance. And if you have a vertical surface, that's simply the height. The same is if you have a vertical tube, it's the height of the tube. But if you have a horizontal surface, it's instead the width of the surface. Okay, let's uh, try to calculate an example. 